Good morning, church. Welcome and happy Sabbath. We're so glad you could join us this morning. Virtually again, yes, but we're together nonetheless. Can you believe it's been a year, right? Since uh, they started locking us down. But God is good all the time. And he has seen fit for us to find a way to be together and worship together. So I pray that you find blessing this morning. I pray that you hear God's voice. I pray that you feel God in your heart and that his love overwhelms you this morning. Happy Sabbath and welcome to worship. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. We hope that you are blessed by knowing how marvelous and wonderful our God is. And we pray that this song reminds you of that. <laughs>
Sabbath, everyone. Today's offering is for our local church budget. As posted on our website, llfc.org, ending on March 6, 2021, our year-to-date budget goal that started October 2020 is $210,000, and we receive $221,000. Praise God for having $11,000 over our budget goal. And thank you for our faithfulness in giving back. Please continue to submit your donation online or please send by mail to Loma Linda Filipino Church, P.O. Box 579, Loma Linda, California, 92354. And as we continue to give, let us remember the spirit of the poor widow in giving, that she gave the least or the smallest two coins compared to the rich who had given large amounts. But yet Jesus said that the poor widow has put in more than all. And why is that? Well, the poor widow gave her heart as part of her offering. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Our dear Father God in heaven, we praise you for this opportunity of showing our love and experiencing the joy of giving back our tithes and offerings. Thank you, O oh Lord, for your loving care to each one of us. Thank you for being the provider of all our needs. And I pray for your blessing that this will go no mighty way to help further your work and glorify your name. Please bless us all and help us, Lord, to give with love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hello, brothers and sisters. I invite you to please bow your heads as I pray. Our most gracious, loving, heavenly Father, I give honor and praise to you, not only because you are all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present, but also because you are our Redeemer, our loving Savior, and friend. I ask the Lord to please forgive all of our sins and any shortcomings that we have committed. And may it be that you fill us with the Holy Spirit, that our thoughts, our words will be acceptable in your sight, especially this blessed Sabbath morning. Lord, we ask you to please pour the Holy Spirit and instill it in us that we may walk and abide with you every moment. Help us to ask for the, the pouring of the Holy Spirit every day, every moment, every second of our lives. As we navigate through this life with a lot of things going on around us, Maybe the pandemic, the social troubles that we are experiencing right now, the political issues that we hear. Maybe, Lord, that you will be our focus and that our eyes are always turned upon you. The world definitely is trying to distract us away from our relationship with you. So we ask the Lord to please help us to stay firm in our faith and that you would send us the Holy Spirit that we may stay strong, courageous, and willing to proclaim our faith to others. 
Father, please be with Loma Linda Filipino Church, the pastoral staff, its leaders and church members. Help each one of us that we may be receptive to your calling. And though we're not able to meet together, maybe Lord that you would help us to continue to communicate with each other and encourage in our, our brothers and sisters. And that as we go through this and finally be able to meet again, we'll be able to share our experiences and continue to encourage one another, strengthening our faith. Please be with our virtual service this wonderful Sabbath. May it be that our speaker, our message today will instill in our hearts and we may carry on into our journey, into our life's journey and put it into practice. And Lord, continue to be with each of our families that we may all be healthy and we may all be strong and that our faith will not waver and will continue to honor and praise you and glorify you every day. Thank you so much for everything that thou hast given to us. And though that's why we give all our praise and glory to you, for you are a wonderful and awesome God and a loving friend. Thank you very much, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. This we ask in the loving, precious name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Continuing our series of uh, the Doctrine of Last Days, there's a story in William Shakespeare's um, novel called The Merchant of Venice. And there's a character named Shylock, and the story goes like this. The sight of the glistening knife of Shylock was enough to strike terror and fear into the heart of Antonio. He had defaulted on a loan taken from Shylock, and so as part of the frightening conditions of the contract, Shylock had uh, demanded taking a pound of flesh should he fail to pay back the loan in time. Standing before the jury, Antonio is overwhelmed with a dreadful sword of Shylock that uh, hangs over his head, that his fears dominate his trial and obscures the role of the jury. All he seems all that he sees across the horizon of the judgment hall is Shylock and his sword. Furthermore, his sense of fear is heightened by the fact that Shylock remains totally inflexible and insists on his pound of flesh. However, unknown to Antonio, and here's the good part, the jury, including his friend Portia, is doing everything possible to save him from the real threats of Shylock. And as the story ends, the jury frears Antonio from the menacing sword of Shylock. What's the good news about the judgment? Well, like Antonio, with the terrible knife of Shylock staring at him, ready to pounce for a pound of his flesh, the thought of a coming judgment often saps our hope and smothers us with fear and dread. After all, who is not afraid of God's wrath, which has been portrayed with gruesome horror and terror for as long as you've known in your Bible studies and in your uh, Bible classes? I recall reading about the alarm and panic that gripped the hearts of the congregation when Jonathan Edwards was preaching his most famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You remember that? I should Google it and read it sometime. It reminds me of a lot of Adventist sermons on the judgment. The concept of judgment tied in with this graphic illustration of the inferno of hell made some of the present members reach out to grab and hold tight onto the columns of the church lest they slip to down under. The scenario looks even more frightening whenever we pause to reflect on the fact that we shall be judged with reference to our works. You see Matthew 7, 21, Romans 14, 12, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, for example. And besides the truth that all have sinned, based on Romans 3, 23, coupled with the thought that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23, is it enough, is it enough to snuff out all ho hopes, signals of hope in a future judgment? For the question is, who can stand the divine searchlight? Sister White captures the intensity and um, frankness of God's searchlight in this following words. She writes, Opposite each name in the books of heaven is entered with terrible exactness every wrong word, every selfish act, every unfulfilled duty, and every secret sin with every artful dissembling. Heaven sent warnings or reproofs neglected, wasted moments, unimproved opportunities, the influence exerted for good or for evil with its far reaching results, all are chronicled by the recording angel. Why, doesn't that give you encouragement and hope? But that is not the full picture, my friends. That is not the full picture. Beyond the barely visible rays of light at the end of this frightful tunnel of judgment is a glowing glimmer of light and hope. Scripture presents a wonderful array of reasons that we can live in joyful anticipation of God's judgment rather than shrivel up in fear and dread. So before sharing this glorious vistas of hope, 
However, let's remember who it is that wants to frighten us about the coming judgment. Who it is who wants to distract our attention from all things but dread and fear in this judgment. The chief antagonist, like Shylock in The Merchants of Venice story by William Shakespeare, there is someone who scares us about the judgment. The Bible rightly identifies this someone as the accuser of our brethren. See Revelation 12.10. He has a long-standing track record of cruelty. He was the one behind the fall of our first parents. He was the one who's a maestro at deception and misrepresentations. In fact, Jesus Christ himself identified him as the father of lies. Check out John 8.44. He, if you will, holds a doctorate degree in rebellion against God. He has a master's degree in inciting us to sin and is a bachelor in flatteries, empty promises, and vain allurements. He is a skillful general with an incredible and intractable working experience of more than six millennia. He is committed to the destruction of humanity. And he was the architect behind the suffering of Job. He was the fierce complainant against Joshua the high priest. And currently, he is the relentless accuser of God's people. Look at Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 to 12. On the other end, who is our defender? We do not have to give way to despair because of the devil's temptations and accusations. Since the fall, God has been on a relentless mission to reconcile us to himself. And that's why this sanctuary service is God's operation room where salvation is being enacted. Amen? That's good news. Well, let me highlight one aspect of the sanctuary service that may dispel our fears of the judgment. Do you want to know what it is? It has to do with the breastplate of the high priest. Check out Exodus 28, 29. Described in there is function. It's functioned like this. And so Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. As a child growing up in the Adventist church, I thought that the sanctuary service was all about calculation of historical dates and ancient movable structures in the wilderness. Maybe you thought the same way as I did. However, I somehow overlooked the particular element of God's rescue plan. And that's the good news of the judgment. God instructed Moses to design a breast place for the high priest. Yes, he did. And the names of those 12 tribes of the Israel, children of Israel, were engraved on the breastplate. Did you know that? And as the high priest bore the breastplate on his heart, so Jesus, our heavenly high priest, bears our names on his heart before our Father. Using a simple and yet profound imagery, Christ the High Priest has the names of his children on his heart. He has your name. He's got your name. He has your name. He has my name. He has our names on his heart. And this point becomes more significant when we realize that this is a judicial setting. Can you imagine the sense of assurance you may have when you stand before the U.S. Supreme Court knowing that the Chief Justice is your personal friend, a personal friend who knows you by name and deeply cares about you? That's the good news of the judgment. The high priest wore the breastplate as a memorial before God. Interestingly, the word translated memorial is related to the verb remember. Isn't that good news? Whenever God remembers, my friends, deliverance is not far away. 
Whenever God remembers, deliverance is not far away. This link between God and remember occurs only four times in the Bible. Where do you say? In Genesis 8, 1. When God remembered Noah, he and his family were all saved from the flood. In Genesis nineteen twenty nine, when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, God remembered Abraham and delivered Lot. In the third example, after struggling with the desperation and humiliation of barrenness, when God remembered Rachel, she gave birth to Joseph. Genesis 30, 22. And finally, after more than four centuries of hard servitude and oppression, Israel was delivered when God remembered them. Exodus 2, 24. So my friends, here is the hope that we can be completely confident of, that Jesus, our high priest, bears our names on his breastplate and continually remembers us before God. In fact, more than being our defender, Jesus assures us that the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, John 5, 22. So the defender is also the judge which helps us better understand another text in John 3, 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. That's the good news about the judgment. The defender is also the, is the judge. And that's why John 3, 18 is good news. Forever believes in him, the son is not condemned. And so we can live without fear. Why then should we dread the judgment when Jesus has our names engraved on his breastplate, making intercession for us before the Father? He is the only attorney who can say with confidence and tender sympathy, See, 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 I've inscribed you on the palms of my hands, and your walls are continually before me. Check out Isaiah 49, 16. A story is told about an angry lion that met a lamb. The lion was ready to pounce on the weak and helpless lamb for dinner. But surprisingly, the lamb showed no fear at all. Approaching the lion, approaching the lamb, the lion saw a hunter behind it with his rifle cocked and ready to shoot the lamb should he attempt to move further, farther, further towards the lamb. And in desperation, although furious, the lamb ran, the lion ran away with disappointment. So in line with that story, we are no match for the devil, the accuser, but with Jesus as the judge and our defender, we can face the judgment without fear. And with this assurance, we can say with Martin Luther, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. For God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Isn't that the good news about the judgment? Knowing that Jesus is our sympathetic advocate, knowing that Jesus is our attorney, knowing that Jesus is our defender, and knowing Jesus as well is our judge in the heavenly sanctuary. The author of the book of Hebrews writes, with confidence to fellow Christians, listen, listen to what Paul says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable 
to empathize with our weaknesses. No, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. And the good news, yet he did not sin. And because of that, Paul continues, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I'd like for you to memorize that chapter and verses found in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. That answers the good, the question, what's the good news about judgment? And being now conscious of this wonderful rescue plan, Satan has sought throughout history to present God, present God as a harsh, demanding, and relentless God who is ready and quick to condemn us. And he seeks with intense, growing intensity and zeal to divert our minds from this wonderful work that Jesus is doing on our behalf. It is said, the arch deaver hates the great truths that bring to view an atoning sacrifice and an all-powerful mediator. He knows that with him, everything depends on his diverting minds from Jesus and his truth. Alan said that. We can hold on to that with hope. And instead of being afraid, and instead of dreading the coming judgment, we can live in joyful anticipation of the judgment because we know, we know that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Repeat that with me wherever you are. Romans 8, 1. There is when, now, what? No condemnation. For whom? For those who are where? Who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that the good news about the judgment? And Jesus himself put it this way. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. Following the very familiar John 3, 16, read and commit to memory verses 17 and 18. As I close, as children of the heavenly kingdom, we can live without the fear of God's judgment. Why? Because with Jesus, with Jesus, my friends, who's our best friend. With Jesus, who is our Redeemer, bearing our names on his breastplate before the Father. We have, present tense, everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but have passed from death into life. Hope you are enjoying this series of the doctrine of last things. I know it can seem so doctrinal and so um, highbrow, but I hope today you have heard what's the good news about the judgment and it's given you hope, not fear and dread. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you that our judge is also our defender. May that one single truth we can take hold of today, bring comfort and hope in our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. We hope that you were blessed by today's message. And we blessed by this song.
church family, it's my hope that you found blessing in the message this morning and that you heard God's voice in your heart. Just a reminder to hit that subscribe button below. That way you stay connected with us and all the videos that we release in the future. Until then, I hope to see you soon and God bless.